Okay, this is part four of this tutorial. And now we're at the point where we've gotten our VMware backup files off of the VMware server. Remember, we used XSI script to create the backups. Then we went ahead and we took those off of the server, put them over to this little uh, bricks, gigabyte bricks, little tiny machine, which is like an Intel Nook. And that copied it over to the hard disk using wget. So, cute little solution. Now, this is all local, if that's possible. You're running some huge files, but it's on a local network. It takes a few hours, maybe, get it done. You also need time to run the backup on the server. So, you know, you start this thing around midnight, one in the morning. It goes pretty good. Now the question is, how to get this off-site? Of course, you could pop out the hard disk. But how do you do it over the internet or get it far? In my case, I need to get it really far. I need to get it all the way to Shanghai. Now, getting it to Shanghai from Taiwan, where I am, doesn't seem like it's that far. But if anyone has experience with the internet in China, you'll know that the problems are endless, especially with connections overseas. Speed connections, just stopping connections, and etc. So let's take a look at how we do that. The first thing I do is I get another one of these BRICS machines and I take one of these little BRICS machines and I take it over to China. So imagine I've got one BRICS machine here and another of these BRICS machines somewhere else and they're both running Fedora. Now I could go ahead and try rsync but the problem with rsync is I could not get it to send the sparse file in a way that only updated the delta, the changes in the file. Now I read the instructions, I read the man page, I read everything I could find out about it and other people have this issue too and some people claim that it does work. I could not get it to work reliably and it was very worrisome and the last thing I would want is early in the morning, say 2 a.m., 3 a.m., one of these files starts going and we're talking about 30 gigabytes and it just sends the whole thing for some reason. Um, I'm on a campus, I can get away with a lot of bandwidth, but I can't get away with that much bandwidth usage. That would be a problem. So I don't want that. What I do want is the bricks machine I take to Shanghai. Inside of there I put a very large SSD. I think it was a 500 gigabyte SSD and I want all of my servers to be on there. So what I'll do is I'll preload them first. So I'll just manually go ahead and take them and copy them over. Take that machine over to Shanghai. Now I want to only send the delta between them, the parts of the VMDK files that have changed. So let's take a look on the server, what we have. And this is what the files look like. So the files have come off of the VMware server They've gone through the BRICS machine and now they're sitting on an external hard disk and that's what this is right here. It's an external hard disk through a USB 3 connection and these are all of my servers that are backed up. And each one of them, each server has three files, a VMDK, a VMDK flat file, and a VMX file. And if we go ahead and look at one of these files, you can see their size can be quite large. This is 27 gigabytes for a, I'm quite sure this is a CentOS machine. If we look at a Windows machine, a VMDK flat file for Windows. That's going to be way bigger, 100 and 7 gigabytes. So that's pretty large. The last thing I want uh, is all of that going over the internet. So what can we do? Well, this took me a long time and I certainly spent a lot of time working with rsync, thinking I could get that right. Because I use rsync a lot for data backup. But for this, I just couldn't get it working in a reliable way. Very frustrating. And I was just worried about the risk in the future that something would go wrong. So I saw on some posting areas some people had mentioned a tool and I looked into it, and it's called VertSync. VertSync. Now, VertSync 
is at the website www.vertsync.com. And VertSync is made by a guy named Chris. And um, Chris has just uh, made an incredible tool here. Uh, VertSync is not open source. It's not for free. Um, but it's a great tool. Now, I'll just quickly scroll down here to the prices because I don't want you to uh, think, hey, this is uh, great, but then later you find out the prices are, are horrible. No, I want to say right from the beginning, the price is extremely reasonable. So you buy VertSync for each machine, and so you're going to need it for two machines. And a two-machine price in U.S. dollars is about $100, $98. So for $98, you have a two-machine situation. Now, you can be using it uh, locally to copy between two machines, and what it's going to do is just speed up your time. Now, I've considered that. I'd have to buy another copy to put on my uh, gigabyte machine, so I actually could... Well, actually, I said that wrong, to put onto my server machine, right? Because what I've got right now is I've got VertSync on this machine in one country. I have another one of these machines in Shanghai, so Taiwan, Shanghai, and both of those machines have VertSync so they can pass back and forth. If I bought another copy of VertSync, I could put it onto the VMware server, and then from the server, I could be using VertSync back and forth. Now, right now, I don't do that. I use the wget, and that works fine for me, and I don't need anything else, but that's because they're local, so bandwidth is not a concern. So $100, think about it, $50 on each side, and that does the job. Um, you can go ahead and find out some other prices here. Three machines is $150. Th uh, four, five machines, 10 machines, and so on. All right, so when I found out about this, some people had mentioned it, but no one really described it in detail. And Chris's uh, website is very uh, streamlined, very basic, and he doesn't really uh, promote it as being the cure-all or fix-all. He's very just straightforward, says what it does, and, and that's it. You know, you might even, if you weren't careful, overlook its importance or how uh, feature-rich it really is. So what does it do? Well, it's rsync, basically. It runs just like rsync, only it's going to specifically only be backing up the parts of the files that are changed for really huge files. And when I say huge files, what are we talking about? We're talking about the MDK files. And it just works. Here are a couple screenshots that uh, Chris has put on his page, and this is what it looks like when it's running. The dots mean that there is no delta between the two files. So you'll have these two systems, in my case, two Fedora systems, and the one will just SSH over, and then they'll activate the program, which is VertSync, and you can see that the VertSync has some uh, commands you can add to it, and not a lot. It's not a lot of feature sets on there, but the basic things work. Dots mean no change, so it just checks for a change, and it just goes dot, 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 moves along, and the Larger than means that there is a change in the data and some data is being transferred. When it's done, you get a readout of how long it took and how much data was actually transmitted. And this is something that's kind of a good example, uh, dot, 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 and then bigger than, bigger than, bigger than. So you get this kind of some data going, some data not going. And its man page is right here talks about some of the different options you have, and they're okay, they're, they're you know, nothing super, super special. So that's just about it. You get down to the bottom and that, that's all she wrote. Okay, it would really be easy to overlook the importance of this. So what I've done is I've used this every night. So every night we do the backup and then we use the vert sync to send over the delta and we're going over to Shanghai. So let me sum this up to let you see how this, uh, how this works because it's a little bit um, challenging in the detail. So I've got two of these machines, two of these little BRICS machines, one in Shanghai, one in Taiwan. Now, the VertSync only runs 
from one side. So it has to run from the sending side, not from the receiving side. And so that caused me a little bit of a problem because on this side where I am in Taiwan, where my server is, they're in the same room, IPs are fixed. But on the place I want to send it to, the destination, which is way over in Shanghai, they're on, a, on a, um, some kind of hookup uh, from the telecom company and their IP changes. Now it doesn't change all the time, but it does change if they switch on and off and they switch on and off a lot to help the connection speed back up. So what I have to do is I have to, con I have to actually SSH from Shanghai over to this machine in Taiwan. So SSH over. And this all has to be done with an automated bash script that runs from, from a cron job. It comes over and logs in. So the keys have to be all set up. So you log in and then from this side, go ahead and run VertSync. Now I, I wrote Chris an email and asked him about this. You know, I said, can it be started from the other side in a kind of pool rather than a push, which is the great advantage of, um, of of rsync, which is rsync can be push or pull, but vertsync, I hope I said that right, vertsync cannot do that. Vertsync is only push. So I have to log in from Shanghai, then from that login window, launch the vertsync and push the changes through. Now, if there's not a lot of changes, it could be pretty fast. It all depends on the internet speed. From where I am in Taiwan to Shanghai, the speed sometimes can be horrible. But we're talking about a lot of servers, six to eight servers at a time, and their minimum size of 20 gigabytes. They're not getting tons of changes every day, but there are changes on them. So some data is always going. And the ability of VertSync to check that, confirm there's no data, and for any data send data, is just amazingly useful, and it just really works. Now, when I come in from the Shanghai side, because their IP can change, I also, on that side, have a bash script that grabs the current IP, comes over, uses that variable, the current IP, and then puts that into the vertsync command to send over the vertsync. So I just want to emphasize that the vertsync is really great. It's, you know, the page is real basic. It's not super easy to grasp how powerful this tool is. In fact, I think it would be really easy to underestimate this. And when you look at the page Chris has set up, I think you have to be already very familiar with rsync and um, backing up and the reason why you would use this big files, sparse files. If you never use sparse files or you're just beginning to, you might say, well, what is the point of this? What am I, what, what's its benefit? But I think Chris has created an incredibly great program and it's given me no issues once I figured out, you know, how to get the push going, even though what I really needed was a pool. Um, but once I figured that out and I got the keys all exchanged, everything ran smoothly and I run it every night. So that's how to get a very big file. I think it completely depends on your internet speed, your connectivity, reliability, how long it's gonna take, and of course, how much is changing in your VM machine. If you got a lot of changes, it's gonna take more time. Now, I run that every night and then on the bash automation script I set up, I also have an email set up so that an email is automatically sent out when things are done. And when it is done, I also check the files over in Shanghai. So I have a bash script that checks the time. And if the time of the file that's written to is the, t the, the change date, if that change date is less than 24 hours and everything's okay, I get an email that confirms everything worked out. If that is more than 24 hours, I get an email saying the backup failed. Now, one problem with that is, is that VertSync could begin a transfer. All it needs to do is write one byte and the uh, change date stamp is gonna change, but then it may fail, the connection may stop, and in that case, uh, it actually didn't finish. And so you would, you know, how are you gonna check that? Because there's no way to really know. The date stamp of the file has changed because you did get some delta in, maybe a few bytes, but then the connection dropped off, it didn't finish. So one easy way to do that is you do it twice. 
I mean, if you do it early in the morning and there's no other changes going on in your database or in your system, in your VM machine, you, you come over, you say, hey, uh, I'm going to push that delta over. You push it. And if there's no changes, it'll just go dot, 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 dot. Just like in the screenshot here, dot, 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 uh, meaning no changes. And even if you did have a very small change, it would just be one little change there. And it would just go through that fairly fast. Again, it depends on your connectivity. But if you're not doing anything else, it's, it's not bad. Now, I have not you know, used Wireshark or measured very closely the bandwidth that's used for that checking. But I don't think it's very much because I've watched it go through it when I've had very poor connectivity uh, speed, and still the speed of, of vert sync going through is really good. It's, it's really uh, not bad at all. The only problem is, of course, if you get a cutoff, it doesn't recover from that. It just stops. So I do it twice. Uh, once to send the delta, and another time to double check that everything was sent through. And then finally, re uh, to send the emails and check again to make sure everything was OK. And if everything was. Uh, change as it should be updated every day and confirmation email comes through and then it shuts down the machine in Shanghai. So that's another point that that machine in Shanghai that I'm using so if we look over here again at my this is my machine in Taiwan this is the server this is the uh, uh, BRICS machine one of these BRICS machine is also in Shanghai of course I don't want my Shanghai uh, backup running all of the time I only run it during the backup time. So it has a bias a timer set up, turns on like two in the morning, and then it begins contacting the machine in Taiwan. And then when the Shanghai is received, all of the vert sync backup is all done. Then I go ahead and uh, run a shutdown script and it shuts down. Also, the IPs are restricted so that this machine in Shanghai will only respond to uh, any kind of input coming from this IP. It won't take commands from anywhere else. So I just uh, shut down in the HTTP configuration. I just shut down uh, everything except the IP, which is fixed, which I do know. So no, nobody can be logging into that machine uh, randomly or trying to hack that machine in Shanghai, which saves me a lot of trouble. I don't get a lot of you know login attempts because it will only accept an SSH from here. Now. It's the Shanghai machine that contacts this local machine through an SSH and starts the whole exchange. But still, during that time, it's on for the backup. That can be many hours. That could be three, four, five, sometimes six hours to uh, send all that stuff, and connectivity could be slow. Uh, inside the Bash script, of course, I cannot uh, run the VertSync commands um, concurrently, because if they run concurrently, there's really no way to know that the jobs have been completed. So I run them one at a time, just one, 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 one. And that way, when it gets to the end, I can run a script that uh, is waiting for the VertSync commands to complete. And when they complete, I can go ahead and then check the time stamp and then go ahead and do an email and a shutdown. All right, so that's a general idea. Uh, in the notes, I'll put a, a few examples of some of these things we've talked about. And I hope that helps you to maybe um, get in the right direction. And if you have any comments or ideas for me, please leave them in the comment area. Thank you.